As we are wrapping up this year of becoming, 2021, the year of becoming, becoming what God has built us to be, as we are rapidly wrapping this series up, we wanted to touch base on a couple things that we thought would be very important as we end out the year. And one of those things that is so important to me is passion for our Lord Jesus. I am a passionate person in certain areas, right? So I'm a little bit of a spaz in general that when I have a lot of energy, I only have two modes. I have what you see on the pulpit and then I have zombie mode. Those are my only two modes that when I get done preaching a full weekend, by the time I get home, I'm the walking dead. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just watching TV and not talking, all right? But when I'm in my hyper mode, I'm incredibly passionate about what I do about the Lord Jesus. And I want to talk about that today. And I want to begin by sharing a phrase that I heard a number of years ago that captured my attention. And it was this, we are led by our loves. We are led by our loves. The reason why that was so captivating to me is I love when someone can boil down to the very core motivation of human nature. Why do we make the billions of tiny decisions that we make in our lives throughout the entire lifetime? Why is it we do what we do? We are primarily led by what we love. And you go, well, hold on a second, Pastor. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I, I, I've had fear motivate a lot of my decisions. Ah, do you understand what you just said? Your love is security. The fear is driving you to make decisions for the love of feeling safe, so you will do anything to feel safe. That's still being led by what you love. So I want to ask you, what do you love the most? If you love relationships or attention the most, you will go to extreme degrees to be able to feel connected to another human being. You will do things right, you will do things wrong. If the love of your life is sports, you will do some extreme things in order for your love to be able to flourish. So my question for you is what do you love the most? How do you act about that thing or that person? What is the highest level of passion that you have about that topic? Now, I want us to be consistent with who we are. What we must never do is play the comparison game, yeah? We can learn from one another, we can role model off each other, but we never compare. You are a unique individual. You do not compare with somebody else. Well, they do this, and that seems fancy for that. They're different. It's apples and oranges. Don't compare. Here's my point. If you are a mellow person, there are some of you that if you won the lottery today, your eyebrows only go up a half inch. Like, you are so dead mellow, we're not sure you're alive, but you're walking. You're so chill. Praise the Lord for you. Here's why. Over the last two years, when everyone's freaking out, you're the only reason our society held together. Because there's a bunch of the rest of us that are pinging off the walls about everything. We need the mellow people, right? But then there's also people that are super expressive. People that don't have any problem raising their hands to the Lord, dancing before the Lord. People that have no problem yelling like me, right? And for absolutely no reason at all. I have a microphone. There's no reason for me to yell. And yet I'm always yelling. I don't know why. Now, there are some people that are super expressive in the things they love, but when it comes to Jesus, they just simply aren't. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. We are in football season, and we are also in winter, which always reminds me of Green Bay Packer fans, right? Now, Green Bay is the epitome of cold, right? I mean, if we're either talking about Buffalo, New York, or we're talking about Green Bay, somewhere up in New England, there's going to be some serious cold. There are guys out there that will take their shirts off and paint their chest, which, by the way, it is not a good billboard 
billboard. Just letting you know. Any guy that ever paints his chest usually should not. You understand what I'm talking about? Paints his big letters and is out there in the snow screaming for the Packers. But they come into church quiet as a mouse. Ah, I got a problem with that. You see, now if you are mellow and, and your favorite team scores a touchdown and you go, yay. Okay, cool. I got no problem with you being chill at church, right? The song comes on. Man, even when you got married, you were like, yay. Even when you had your first child, you were like, yay. That's all you got, all right? There's nothing wrong with being consistent that that's your yay. Okay, I get it. But if you are passionate in other areas of life, but when it comes to Jesus, nothing moves the needle. I got a problem with that. You see, I believe that we need to at least be consistently passionate about Jesus as much as we are anything else in our life that we love. Do you love Jesus the most? Do you act about, think about, the same way of Jesus as the very thing and person you love the most? The fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you, if you are online, you can always fire up the app. That'll be a little bit easier for you. Make sure to fire up the app, and you can do the fill in the blank as well. Here's the fill in the blank. Tepid passion betrays a bored heart. Tepid passion betrays a bored heart. How many of us no longer believe it is good news, it's just old news? You see, what I want to do today is recapture that first love. I want to inspire you to love Jesus more than anything else in your world. And I hope that the Holy Spirit will allow me to inspire you to do that. I got two stories for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels tell the story of a woman anointing Jesus with oil. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever heard a message on the anointing of Jesus by a woman of oil? Anybody ever heard one of those? Whole bunch of you. If you have not, you've never read this story, you are in for a treat. These stories are absolutely stunning. But here's what you may not know. It happened to Jesus twice. One time it was up in the north, in the Galilee area where he grew up, and that was a woman that was a known prostitute. And she came and wept over his feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and then anointed them with perfume. The other woman was in the south, in a town just two miles outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. That was Jesus' very close friend, Mary, who was also sister to Martha and Lazarus. Two very different accounts, but they sound almost identical. Why? Both women anointed his feet at a dinner party in the house of a guy named Simon. How random is that, right? You would go, man, it's the same people. No, it's not. Too many differences. Why did it happen twice? I would suggest to you that I believe that Mary had always heard about the story of the woman that anointed the feet of Jesus. I, she was not there, likely, but she had always heard about everyone astounded that a woman would go so far out of her comfort zone that she would do things so scandalous and so radical that everyone kept talking about that one night. And I bet you Mary said, I wonder when my turn will be. And then one day she found out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through those two stories. I'm going to talk about how they're similar how they're different, and then I'm going to share something very personal from my life about how I remain passionate for Jesus after all these years. Does this sound good? All right, let's dive into this. Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 36? Luke chapter 7, verse 36. If you're brand new to the Bible and you have an ESV or maybe grabbed a Bible under the seat in front of you, it is page 864, 864, that'll get you there faster. Matthew, Mark, Luke is where we're going to be, and then there's John. Now, when they record the stories, Matthew, Mark, and John record Mary's version. Luke records the other woman's version. We're going to start with that, all right? So you can read along with me in there. It says this. 
One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at his table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, well, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you gave me no water to wash my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All right, let's recap. Many of you have heard the details of this. I don't have time to go into all the details, but let's recap what we heard. Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house for dinner. Now, if you're new to Christianity, the Pharisees were kind of like the popular kids. They were the super conservative. They were the religious ones that they kind of were all about following rules. Morality was very important to them, even more so than heart intent. They were the ones that kind of were able to pull the strings. They happened to have more of the wealth. They didn't know what to do with Jesus. Jesus was a little too liberal for them. Jesus was doing all kinds of radical stuff. He was involving women in his ministry. He was doing all sorts of radical things like uh, challenging the religious status quo. But they could not deny that he was a miracle worker, a demon caster. He was someone who could heal. So they knew he was legit in one way, but they kind of held him at arm's length because he wasn't part of their team. One of those invited Jesus to come in. They were kind of testing him and figuring him out. Now this is interesting. We know that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, but understand he also ate with Pharisees. Too often we kind of slide to one side or the other when in fact Jesus welcomed both into his life. The Pharisee brings him in, sets him down, and in comes a known prostitute. How the heck did she get in the house? Now, if you're talking about a super conservative, super morality-based, super restrictive and legalistic group, how did she get in his house? Now, the speculation goes all over the place, right? Is it possible she knew some of the dudes at the table? You understand what I'm saying? Everybody knew where she worked. They're like, you're Broadway and 30th, yeah? <laughs> right? Everybody knew what she did for a living. But she gets into the house, into the party, and then it says she begins to weep over the feet of Jesus. Now, this sounds very odd until you get into an ancient Middle Eastern mindset. We have got to leave modern-day America and translate ourselves all the way back 2,000 years ago into the Middle East. Because when we think about having a dinner party, we think about sitting in chairs at a table. It's very difficult to cry on someone's feet under a table, right? 
Okay, leave all that behind. We're talking about a low table. We're talking about cushions. We're talking about leaning down and eating while laying down. When you lay down in order to engage with the inner circle, your feet are out behind you. That is the one place she would have access to. Does that make sense? Now, once again, what's she doing there? It says she heard he was there, so she showed up. Well, hold on. I don't know if any of you have ever had dinner with a famous person, but I don't think that you sent out notices to the community that they could just show up whenever they wanted. Ah, you're thinking modern-day America. In the Middle East, hospitality is everything. It is today, was a long time ago. But it got a little bit extreme and a little bit odd. Now, even today, it is so intense to provide a banquet. I remember reading a story about a young man who wanted to marry his fiance, and he was from the Middle East. He worked for four years to save up the money for the banquet dinner of the wedding. His family didn't have any money. So he worked for four years, saved up money, and just had one wedding banquet. Now, the reason why it was so expensive is you have to invite all the family, you have to invite all the famous people in your town, and you need to do it in such a lavish spread that everyone would talk about your dinner to other people. It was a way of displaying your wealth and a way of saying, I can take care of my bride. It was a way of showing her family she was going to be okay. The sad thing is, the story went on to say he then had to leave his wife for the next three years to now start saving up money for them to live. In other words, there's such an extreme value of banqueting. Well, in the ancient world, it got even weirder. And here's what I mean. According to Kenneth Bailey, who wrote a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. If you've never read that book, that is a brilliant book. He also wrote Paul Through Middle Eastern Eyes. And he talks about the customs and traditions of the Middle East. According to him and some other research I did, in the ancient world, they would have banquets that people could observe. Now, the reason why is you're about to throw a super fancy spread, and you want everyone to know what an amazing dinner you threw, so you allow an audience to show up. People can literally come and hang out around the outside. They are not allowed to eat. They are not invited guests. They're just there to be flies on the wall and observe and listen to the conversation. Now, this sounds so creepy to me, right, that you're sitting there eating away and there's people just watching. There could be the poor, they could be the uninvited, but they all get a chance to watch. Maybe that is what was going on here, that she was part of the audience or the crowd around them because he was famous. All right, so now she's in the house, but here's the key part I want to highlight for this story. Notice the demeanor between the host and her as a guest. Jesus points this out. Hey, Simon, you don't treat me like she does. Why is that? How did he treat him? He said, you know what? I walked into your house. You didn't seem to think I was all that big of a deal. As a matter of fact, you've been pretty standoffish since day one. This lady breaking all sorts of taboos so far out of her comfort zone. She's doing things that are radical and scandalous, and she doesn't care because she wants to be near me. Here's how we make it personal. These are the people I see coming to church over all the years of my ministry. I got Simons, and I got women that are willing to be extravagant. Here's what I mean. There are some of us that go to church. Now, don't get me wrong. Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner. He wasn't being a jerk. He wasn't wasn't keeping him away. He wasn't being mean to him. As a matter of fact, in the conversation, he referred to him as teacher. He referred to him with an honoring title. He's a relatively nice guy. He's a very moral guy. But he's still determining whether or not Jesus is worth it. You see, he didn't put out too much in terms of greeting with a kiss, anointing the head, 
washing the feet. He didn't want to go overboard because he was still determining who Jesus was and whether he was important enough to go all in for. Is that you? You go to church, don't get me wrong, you're a nice person, you're a super moral person. As a matter of fact, if people asked you, you'd probably call yourself a Christian. But here's the problem. You're still determining whether or not Jesus is worth it. How do I know that? Because you are unwilling to do certain things for him. As long as you believe that you are a higher stature than Jesus, we have a problem. You see, because a servant never decides whether or not they're going to do something for their master. The only question is, what does my master want or what would honor his name? That's the only question that matters. As long as you're coming into church and you're still arguing with yourself about what you will and will not do for Jesus, you're like Simon. You see, the other woman did stuff that just blew everybody's mind. Let me get you a little bit, for those of you that need to catch up, let me explain what she just did. The NICNT commentary, my favorite commentary, said that what this woman did was akin to going topless in the meal. Why? Because here's what she did. She began to weep all over his feet. Why did she then wipe it off? Because he wears sandals, yeah? So when he wears sandals, he comes in with dirty feet. She did not have anything in the house to access. She had water. It came from her. She pours down onto his feet, wipes his feet, knowing she's going to anoint them. But what does she use for a towel? Her hair. It's all she had. But in order to wipe his feet with her hair, she had to what? Undo her hair. Take off her covering. No woman did that. You didn't do that in public. You didn't even do that in your own home in case someone came to the door. You always had your hair covered. In order to make sure your hair never came out, it was bound up behind you. The only way she can wipe is to take her, her covering off, undo her hair, and begin to wipe his feet. Why is that a problem? Because the only time a woman ever did that was in the bedroom. The only one that ever saw it was her husband because she would never do that in public. Now, why was she so free to be able to do that? Well, I don't know. It's kind of what she did for a living. Yeah? Like she was like, hey, I don't care anymore. This isn't about me. I'm, I, don't, I don't care what everybody else thinks. Everyone's going to have all kinds of problems with me even being in the room. She took down her hair, and once again, everybody gasped, and she starts touching a rabbi. Once his feet are clean, she then begins to anoint them with expensive oil. All right. Are you like that? Or are you still determining whether or not Jesus is worth feeling awkward for? Are you still trying to determine whether or not Jesus is worth going out of your comfort zone for? If I told you the altar is open, I want you to come forward and praise the Lord, would you still have a hesitancy to go, yeah, I don't do that? I'm sorry, you don't do that. Did Jesus want it or not? That's the only question that should be in your mind. Don't get me wrong, there's still boundaries and there's still an ability to say this is wise or this would draw attention to myself or you still need to use wisdom. But when you're battling with yourself over what you will do for your king, we have a passion problem. Does that make sense? Here's another thing that I noticed. Jesus said that her reaction was because she loved much for she had been forgiven much. Is that correct? If that is the case, they've had a prior experience. She didn't get saved right there. She was already crying when she walked in. Why? She knew who he was. Why was she so thankful? Why was she so overwhelmed with emotion? I would suggest to you that she got saved recently. 
I would suggest that maybe they had a chance encounter and she realized he is now her savior. He's the one that saw her in a way that no other man had ever seen her and he loved her deeply. I would suggest that her whole life had been transformed and she was looking for a reason to find this guy and honor him in any way that she could. Now here's what's interesting about it. Notice what everyone else thought of her. She's a sinner. Hold up. She was yesterday. She's not today. Human beings are very slow on the uptake about new nature. Everyone's looking at everybody else's past. Where did you come from? Jesus doesn't look that way. He looks at where are you going? Have you had connection with me? Then you're headed towards hope. You are headed towards salvation. You are headed towards sanctification. He does not look at where you come from. This is where I want to set a culture in Bridgeway. You ready? I'm about to set a tone for how we act in this church. You ready? If someone comes into this church that looks different or acts different in a way that you would deem inappropriate or a way that you would deem sinful, I want to tell you the reason why they're here is Jesus has them on a journey going somewhere. Quit looking at where they came from. I want you to look at where they're going. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, this woman, she can run up and touch Jesus. Now, understand this. She knows the rules. The rules in the ancient world in Judaism said this. If you are clean and you touch something unclean, you become unclean. That's how the rules work. It's like the cooties game, right? (laughs) Then why was she comfortable touching him? Because everyone's going to see her touch him, and if she's a sinner and touches him, it makes him unclean. Why did she boldly touch him? Because she knew something the rest of them didn't. Jesus is the very source of purity. Anything unclean that touches purity becomes pure. See, here's the thing. This is something we all need to realize. You're never going to make Jesus unclean with your sin. He is so pure, he's going to purify your stuff when you touch him. You must never be afraid to approach the altar, to admit and confess what you have done. You never need to be afraid that God is going to reject you. He has so much purity, there is no stain that is on you that he can't get out. He will always know what to do with your sin. You can boldly approach the throne of God if you come with a repentant heart because he knows how to make that which is dirty pure. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, is it possible to have the same passion that this woman had? She just got radically saved. She just was radically transformed. She is now weeping over his feet, anointing him with oil. Is it possible to maintain that sort of passion for your whole Christianity? Yes, it is. And how do we know that? A woman by the name of Mary of Bethany. Now, I'm going to read you the second story, but as I told you, Matthew, Mark, and John all tell the story. So I'm going to combine those three accounts into one and read it as if they were all talking together. All right? So you just listen to the story. Six days before the Passover, this is a week before Jesus dies on the cross, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. As he was at the table, Mary came up to him with an alabaster flask of a pound of very expensive ointment made from pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head as he reclined at the table and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And when the disciples saw it, They were indignant, saying to themselves, why was this ointment wasted like that? This ointment could have been sold for a large sum, 
more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, scolded her, saying aloud, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. But Jesus, aware of the scolding, said to them, leave her alone. Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could in pouring this ointment on my body. She has anointed my body beforehand to prepare me for burial, and she may keep the rest for the day of my burial. And truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Sounds familiar? Yes. Very similar? Yes. Same? No. No. Totally different motivation. Why did Mary do this? It was not infatuation. The other lady just met Jesus. She didn't know anything about this guy. He was blowing her mind. She was shocked that he was a prophet, that he was a rabbi, that he was accessible, that he would love someone like her. She was reacting off pure emotion. Mary didn't have any of that. This is Jesus' friend for years. She's not shocked by him anymore. She's always in awe of him, but it's not a shock. She knows who she's talking to. So she did it out of a desperate, continual love for her Lord. It was not about a reaction. And what she was doing was not easy. She knew full well she was walking right into criticism. There were some men, you got to imagine in this group, that didn't like the fact that Jesus had female disciples. The fact that she had sat in the front with them, sat at the feet of Jesus, became a full-fledged disciple, I'm sure that ticked off a whole bunch of them. Woman, you're not doing it the way you should do it. Even the ladies were mad. Martha even tried to correct her when she did that. They were like, that's not how we do it. She said, that is my Jesus. I don't care what anybody else thinks. But sure enough, she got criticism. The disciples started questioning her motives. Judas Iscariot calls her out and embarrasses her in front of everyone. Oh, nice job, lady. We all could have maybe thought about the poor and not thought about ourselves. Maybe we could have used that money and done some good, but no, you got to be all wasteful. Great, so you use this expensive perfume on what? Yeah, the house smells nice. Good job. How expensive was that ointment? You guys know. It starts talking about denarii and all that. Here's how it works. It is a year's wages. I went and looked up yesterday what a year's wages are in America, and the average male salary is $53,000 a year. Let's say it's 50 grand. One ointment, 50 grand. Here's how it works. When they would ship it in, it was an import, so they're shipping it in from India. When they packed it, they never wanted it to lose its potency, so they sealed it in an alabaster jar with a long neck. It was only for one use. You broke the neck and poured it out. Usually they would only use things like that for kings when they were coming into play. They would anoint the head of the king, and they would say, he's now going to be the head of our entire nation. That's what it's used for. She breaks it, and pours it all over Jesus, $50,000. Do you understand why everybody reacted? But then she went further. What also did she do when she had a bunch of ointment on his feet? He can't walk around with all that, so what did she do? She wiped off the excess with what? Her hair. Here we go again. All the guys are like, oh, man, that's why we don't have women around here. Man, they didn't even know how to keep things all up in the business right there. Like, they don't let it all out, right? I can't focus right now. Shut up. It ain't about you. 
This is about Jesus. And she was like, I don't care about the rest of you. You got an issue? You got a problem? I'm worshiping right now. And if you can only focus on my hair and what's going on in your world, something's wrong with you. I'm into my Jesus. And she did the most scandalous stuff. Took out her hair. Now you can imagine other women in society were like, I'm tired of that whole binding my hair thing. I can do whatever I want. For whatever reason, she felt empowered to do that. And she pushed forward and began to wipe his feet with her hair. And she said, I don't care about what anyone else thinks of me. I just care about honoring my Lord. Are you like that? Or are you hesitant? Mary didn't have any tears to shed. She only had love to give. The other woman cried. Mary just loved. After years of knowing this man, after all the years you've been a Christian, does your fire burn the same? That's my question for you. One last side note. In a few days, Jesus was about to have what's called the Last Supper. Anybody remember what Jesus did to his disciples before they got ready for dinner? He washed their feet. Anybody remember how that story goes? Jesus gets down, grabs a towel, and grabs a basin of water, and everyone starts recognizing, oh shoot, he's going to wash our feet like a slave does when you walk in the house. And then Peter freaks out. No, 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 master, you don't do that. We should be doing that for you. But they didn't. They didn't even think about it until Jesus did it first. Mary initiated and did it with a $50,000 bottle of oil. That makes the men look a little embarrassed. Yeah? In a couple weeks, I'm going to turn 50 years old. Now, yeah, praise God. Since I'm going to be 100, I'm halfway there. All right? And I figure halfway through, I should probably reflect on something. And I begin to reflect on this fact. I am just as fired up and passionate about Jesus Christ as I was when I was seven and walked down the aisle to receive Jesus. Amen? Amen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get very personal with you. I'm going to share with you the seven reasons why I believe I have been able to be as passionate today and every day in between without losing my passion in Jesus. Now, the reason why I'm going to share this with you, and as I said, it's very personal, is because I want you to jot down these reasons because I want them to stimulate your heart. I want to inspire you to write your own list. Your list may not be my list. You may have stuff on your list that I didn't even think about. You may have totally different motivations for why you love the Lord the way that you love him. But if indeed you're struggling to figure out how do I keep my passion high for God, may these be little examples, little things that you can write down and say, maybe I need to think about this a little bit different. You ready to go? If you're a note taker, take out your page and let's do this. Number one. Jesus is my hero. Jesus is my hero. Jesus is just flat out cool. He did things no one expected. He kept people off guard. He was winsome and he was wise. He was fun and captivating, a good storyteller and someone you wanted at a party. He was kind and compassionate to the hurting and the poor and he was sweet to kids. He didn't care about being rich and famous. He only cared about people. He was so powerful that he could have killed all his enemies instantly, but he did not. He only did what his father asked him to do. I don't respect anyone on the planet like I respect that man. I want to be just like him. Number two, he's my everything. He's my everything. I literally can't live without him. He didn't just save me. He didn't just create me. He sustains me. When I want to quit ministry, I don't because of him. When I want to fall into despair, he gives me hope. When I want to disappear, he makes me stay out front ministering. When my panic disorder had me sidelined and scared out of my mind, he's the only one that understood and the only one that stayed with me. He knows me through and through and still treats me kindly and gentle. He's the only one that gets me. Number three, I know what he saved me from. 
I know what he saved me from. My greatest fear in life is eternal separation from God. I don't care about death. I care about being away from my God. It's the only thing that scares me. And my Jesus saved me from that fear. I know what I'm capable of. I know what my sin nature is like. I know the only reason I'm not like that is because of the example of Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I never take my life for granted. I am thankful every day because he doesn't owe me anything and I know what it would be like without him. Number four, I see what he does. I see what he does. I have a frontline view of miracles as a pastor. I get to see on a weekly basis God change lives. I see people get healed. I see people get saved. I see people be transformed. I watch people go through the worst times of their life and get out the other side. I see what Jesus Christ does today. Jesus has never been a historical figure for me. He's a figure of right here, right now. I can continue to fall in love with him because he's still doing things every day in my life and around me. I am continually amazed. I'm continually caught off guard. And in my personality, that's bonding. Number five, I love him. That sounds cliche and stupid, but I love him. I love him more than my wife. I love him more than my children. I love him more than my family. I love him more than my church. Why? Because it's the most personal. He knows everything about me. He's experienced everything with me. He cared about me when other people held me at a distance. His love is never contingent on anything. He gives me gifts. He holds me when I cry. He's my encourager and my champion. I have more history with him with shared experiences than anyone on the planet. In all ways that build love, I love him most. Number six, I use everything I learn. I use everything I learn. I don't just see what he can do, he lets me play along. I get to heal people in his name. I get to lead people to salvation. I get to preach to his people. I get to learn from my mistakes and learn from his word. A ton of my passion is doing stuff with him. Every day we walk into the day together and I have no idea what he's about to pull off. He's gonna lead us to do it together. I'm always learning by doing, and I see the next level because I take the first step. I use my gifts. I don't just study and get intellectually filled. I internalize it, and it becomes a part of me. And that keeps me fired up. Number seven, I know there's more. I know there's more. Wherever I am in my walk of faith, there's more. There's more to discover about the Lord. There's more love in my heart to pour out. There's more of his kingdom to experience. There's more of his children to meet. There's more power, more authority, more experiences, more miracles. How can I lose my passion when in 50 years I haven't even scratched the surface? You see, I'm not passionate for the Lord because I'm a different sort of human being. I'm passionate for the Lord because... I live a different sort of life, and he lets me. When I was teaching my youngest daughter to drive, Andy, we were doing the parking lot thing, yeah? Go around the parking lot about 1,000 times. <laughs> and I was teaching her this one concept. I said, "Hun, when we go around that turn, we always slow into the turn and we accelerate out of it. We slow into a turn and we accelerate out of it. She thought that was fun, so we kept doing that. This is what I want for the church. You guys, we're wrapping up some crazy years. Maybe you need to slow into the turn. Maybe this season, all you do is focus on your love for God. Just let him soak into you. Let him remind you how much he loves you. Let him remind you how much he's forgiven you. Let him remind you that he has you on his heart, on his mind, every day. Let him sweep you off your feet again. It's not necessarily a time to do anything right now. I need you to rest in him. I need you to slow into the curve at the end of this year. Because when we go around that turn, we're going to accelerate right out of it. When we kick off in January, we have an entire series 
laid out for you. We have an entire year where we're going to do stuff our church has never done before. I need you rested. I need you fired up. I need you passionate. I need you ready to engage. Because when we hit that turn, we are going to come flying out of that, and we are going to explode as a church. I guarantee you that. And I need you ready to go. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God.